Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're talking with Rob Matthews. Rob draws from his life and from his ideas about spirituality and human weakness and strength. Rob is from the South. He was born in Wilson, North Carolina, and has lived in Philadelphia for a number of years now with his wife, Tracy, and his 22-month-old son, Henry. We're talking with Rob at Art Space Liberty in North Philadelphia, where he runs the gallery, which is in the Liberty Church. So Rob, we first saw your work in 2002 at Moore College in the Greater Philadelphia exhibit. Your drawings in that show were of people who had somehow self-combusted. Can you explain a little about that series of works? Yeah, well, it'll take me a while. It was 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> they, the, the work was coming out of this general curiosity for things that could not be explained, um, even though there was physical proof for them. I found books like for you know like a dollar on eBay that were about it, trying to explain it um, and give you different theories. You mean people really self-combust? Well, there's a couple of different theories on spontaneous human combustion. One, which is called the wick effect, which is usually when someone falls asleep smoking a cigarette and they have a robe on or something that can sort of trap the heat underneath, and then you slowly sort of like burn from the inside out. And so you, you slowly burn rather than just like burning quickly, you'll smolder for like 12 hours. Um, but then there were other examples in, in whatever books I was reading about people that would leave their wife in a room and then come back 30 seconds later and they would just be a pile of ash and fat on the floor and they couldn't really necessarily explain that. But my impression was that for what I remember maybe 75% of the cases is that there was a lot of heavy drinking involved in, and so I don't know if that was a catalyst or what, but uh, yeah, it's strange. But as you, when you look at the images, they're all treated as crime scenes. So they're always photographed as crime scenes. Like I didn't take any images out of the books or anything. I, I normally set up any kind of photo situation that I want for the drawing that I want to make. So I had to sort of like stage all these combustion scenes in my house. So it seems that at the base of it all, you either believe in human self-combustion or you don't believe in it, that there's not a lot of scientific evidence out there. And so I want to segue now into other aspects of your work that have to do with belief and spirituality. So can you talk a little bit about the, the way you approach your subject matter, the spiritual basis of it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think even with that combustion work, there is that element of faith, which is probably the thing that brought me to it anyway, was this unknown that had to be explained as a physical process, but ultimately not every case of it could be explained, you know? And, and somebody came up to me at, I still remember, somebody came up to me at the reception and said, you know that's not real, right? Okay, okay yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> I, I, I made these things. But uh, that was one less artist he got to think about, I guess, that night, because he, he was able to immediately discredit it. But um, I, I think all my art falls under that umbrella of faith. I figured out pretty early on in college or at some point that... I had to have a big idea, even if I only addressed it in small ways, over and over again. The older I get, the more directly spiritual I think the work feels. I think at some point it could have been a little bit more in ambiguous, but the older I get, the, the more difficult it becomes to ignore it. Let's talk about humor a little bit, because at least in one instance, I'm thinking of the Dumbest Man series yeah. of drawings. Um, there's some dark humor that seems to play around the edges, and how do you mash that together? I'm not particularly earnest. If that, I, There's sincerity to me, and there's being earnest. Earnest is when you read somebody's Facebook status, and it's just so sincere, and you're just like, I can't believe that you felt like you really had to go and tell everybody. You know, I mean, even if it's a very sweet thing, I think earnestness is when you take something sincere and you project it to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world, they didn't need to know it. You know what I mean? When I'm thinking about how I'm going to communicate with someone visually, 
earnestness only has one read, and that's just like extreme sincerity. And there's nothing else that you can read into that. And so I've kind of picked humor, and I'm just naturally drawn to something that's dark, because I grew up almost exclusively watching Hitchcock movies from the time I was 10 till I was an adult. But you at least get two takes on it. You know, you get the dark humor, and then you get whatever it is that it's actually supposed to be about. But it acts as a, like a way of allowing more people to enter into the conversation. So can you describe the drawings in that series, just so people know what you're talking about? Uh, the about? Dumbest Man, I can't, oh my gosh, see this is bad, because I'm, I'm horrible with names. It was the, uh, the man who's now deceased that spent the better part of a decade trying to be the first person to fly a balloon around the world. And he was a multi-multi-millionaire, but I can't remember his name. Steve Fawcett, sorry, there you go, that's his name. Um, and he invested millions of dollars and a lot, and it became like a research project, I think, for a, a university in St. Louis to get him to fly a balloon around the, the planet and be the first one to do it. But he was doing this in 2002, 2003, when no one needs to fly a balloon around the planet in 2003, you know? Um, but he finally did it, and if you look at his path, I mean, he made it around, but it was like maybe the lower third of the globe. It wasn't anywhere ne near the equator. I mean, you know, so it was a pretty short flight. And this was probably after five or six failed attempts. And in my mind, I was like, this is this man's dream. And I think it's like completely ridiculous. So between m my opinion of it and his opinion is this wide range of impressions that you can have of this project. I wanted the, the composition to have the balloon in it, but not make it about the balloon. So I started thinking of other people's vision of like what they really wanted in life. I don't know why now, but at the time I thought about all the buildings that I've seen in my life with animals mounted on to the outside of it. And, you know, like there's a steakhouse in San Antonio that I saw that had all these different animals mounted on, you know, like basically like it was their menu in animal form on the outside. And then there was a, um, and then World's Fair towers. The Eiffel Tower was the first one, and then you know the Chicago World's Fair decided we're not going to do that. We're going to create an entirely different kind of uh, engineering feat, and they invented the Ferris wheel. Like you can you can now travel the country and just see ridiculous you know architectural nods to this premise. And and, and so I went to college in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they have the Sun Sphere, which is such a bad thing that it became a parody on. The Simpsons, you know, they built a World's Fair tower, and in theory, you're supposed to be able to get on top of the tower and view everything around you. Like if you go to Paris, you get a good view of Paris from the tower. But they built the Sun Sphere in the lowest part of the city because that's where the park was. So it's not even taller than the tallest building in the city. Built in failure, like they knew it. You know, uh, kind of like all that kind of resonated to me, and that's how I, I structured the drawings. Was more about architectural moments that I find more visually interesting than just a balloon floating through the air. You know. So, sort of about aspiration. It interests me that you're interested in the failures of aspiration or the ridiculousness of aspiration. There's a ridiculous quality. Well, yeah, but I think that's being an artist. Every artist has this vision, and they think it's worth putting out there, including me, you know? I mean, I make stuff. I, it, I was actually emailing a friend. She she had only seen the work that I did for the, the most recent show. She'd only seen it online, and we hadn't really talked about it. She finally said, you know, what is this about? And I said, I'm going to tell you, but it's stupid. It's actually worse to know what it is. You know, because that's when you that's when you say, oh, my gosh, really? This is what you thought of and you really thought I needed to see this, you know, <laughs> Whereas the, the less, you know, probably the, the more rewarding of an experience it's going to be. Two weeks before that show opened, the gallery's like, we need an artist statement. I'm like, you don't want an artist statement. I'm just, I can promise you, you don't want an artist statement, you know. So did you have to write an artist statement or were you able to hold for it? I held out. And it worked out OK. So let, let's talk about your relationship to um, galleries, yeah. because when we first knew you, you were not affiliated with the gallery, I believe. But since then, 
you've been picked up by Gallery Joe. You're, you show at Gallery Joe mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, and you show in New York at Daniel Cooney. Would that have been possible 15 years ago? Because I'm thinking about drawings and how they weren't as hot, for lack of a better word, as they seem to be in the recent past? Uh, I don't know. I, and I, I, just before we go on, I want to note that I, I showed at Shelley Spectre's galleries for a while. I didn't really think about anything like that when I started drawing. I just knew that I didn't want to paint anymore. I'd gone to school for that, and going into my final semester at Virginia Commonwealth, I decided I wasn't going to paint anymore because I was tired of it. And I started drawing. And then my painting instructor came in for a critique, and she said, where are your paintings? And I said, I'm, I'm not really doing that anymore. And she said, well, i got to give you a grade, so you need to paint. I'm just like, really? You know, I'm in grad school. Um, so I did it. I made, like, a thesis show of paintings. And my committee was like, okay, this looks good, you know. And then I went in there one night, not under the influence of anything. I just went in there one night, sleep deprivation. That was what I was under the influence of. And I painted over every one of them. Like, and there was, like, mm, five six-foot-by-six-foot six paintings. And I just painted them all out. And then an instructor You mean came. with, like, blank? I painted over every square inch of the With paintings. white? With or white? Just no, with something. whatever I had. Okay. But it was a mess. Monotone? Oh. No, it was a mess. Okay. Was a <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and then one of the instructors came in the next day, and they're like, what? Did, you know, they're the, I think in their mind they were thinking, like, what are you doing to the reputation of this school? That's my impression, you know. So I knew as soon as they gave me that piece of paper, that said I, I was deemed a master of fine arts, that I was not going to paint anymore. And so when I moved here, I just started drawing. And I didn't know anything about what the likelihood of that being successful was. Um, but it, I just kept working and working. And then I guess it was in 2000, 2000 is when MoMA had the, uh, that giant works on paper show out at the Queen Space, mm -hmm. you know. And that really did set this tone you know, they had that show, and then the Met was doing, like, a Van Gogh drawing show, a Leonardo drawing show, a Rubens, you know, and it was almost like curators had run out of things to talk about, and then they remembered, oh, my gosh, these people draw. You know, we can show that. All that was going on so much at the same time with whatever I was doing that I wasn't even aware of that I was kind of, like, catching a wave, you know? Um, I'm not smart enough to anticipate <laughs> you don't see the future? Trends, you know. Oh, I know the future now. The future now is that I'm getting like completely outpaced by uh, video games or something, you know. But I mean, oh, everything animation. has to move now. Yeah, everything yeah, doesn't have yeah. a time element. Every, you know. Um, hey, you could do that. Climb on board. No, no. Some You're things, a narrative some, guy. Some things need to sit still. You know what I mean? And I'm committed to being the person that makes the stuff that sits still. So let's switch gears here. Can you tell us about the new work you're doing? What, what are you working on now? We were on your website and we saw um, a Baghead series, these mm -hmm. black, black, black drawings. I got sort of uh, to the point where if anybody needs another graphite drawing from me, I've got them. They're there. So, and I had been trying to figure out a way to do work that is more like nocturnal in its setting the darker you make graphite it just it's not it's not dark it's shiny so I just decided I, I needed to draw the light rather than I needed to draw the shadow so I started working on these dark grounds and, and is it dark. ink just out of curiosity what, what is the dark ground yeah, yeah. it's um, depending on the drawing it's either a, a watercolor paper or a printmaking paper and then it's um, a combination of Sumi ink and walnut ink. The, but the work itself, I, I don't know, honestly, the less I know about it at this point, the better. I've been, I, I did so many series where I knew exactly what I was doing and why I was doing it that I kind of like wanted to tell myself a story that I didn't know, you know? And I had a jumping off point. Uh, I have a very st strong memory of when I was uh, 12 and I went to hunt bats with my cousins. <laughs> um, it was just sort of like the most ridiculously chaotic thing I've ever, you know, witnessed. You, well, I mean, they lived near a, uh, 
in, in, the, in a wooded area near a golf course and you just like, and they would throw a tennis ball up in the air and they would wait for these bats to like pick it up on radar echolation or whatever and, and swoop down towards the ball. And as the bat comes down, then they try to hit the bat with a baseball bat. bat. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is that I know, and I don't, I, mean, I have it written down, but uh, I don't know the date off the top of my head, but I know the date because it's the night that Mike Tyson fought Sphinx, Sphinx and um, knocked him out in like 91 seconds because the whole idea for the evening was that we were going over to their friend's house to watch the fight, and by the time we got there, it was done. So we watched it for like 10 minutes, which meant we saw it like five times. And then we, they, went, they didn't have anything else to do, so we went out and did this. So, um, so I had this idea of, about that, and then this is where it gets to the point where you actually don't, the less you know about this, the, the better. It's like even in, in grad school, I was trying to figure out how to make work about it. And um, I was, it was the only time in my life I was ever told by a professor that like, the, she said, I really just don't think this is a good idea. Which, which is interesting to me because I'm now at a point where I don't think there's a bad art idea. I think there's just bad art. You know what I mean? Like you can give 50 artists the same idea and 49 of them might make terrible art, but somebody's gonna figure out something conceptually interesting about it. So I, I kind of abandoned it and, I, and, I, and in the back of my head, I was like, okay, so it's a bad idea. Okay, I can, I can, I can live with having a bad idea. But then I moved here, and the museum's collection is the Malay painting of these kids hunting bats at night. And, and the birds, did I say bat? I meant bird. But uh, they shine a bright light in these birds' eyes and then whack them over the head with a stick. I'm like, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> that's my idea. <laughs> so um, I pulled it back out and I started working with it and I still can't do it. But what it did was it sort of like started me down this like path of telling myself this story in my head. And it the good thing about it is that the longer it goes on, the more kind of like uh um characters or whatever you want to call it, groups develop and the less it actually becomes a story. It just becomes more about me developing these groups and kind of like I know what they mean and I know what I want them to do, but at the rate that I work, I'm never gonna be able to get it done, which is nice. Uh, what I've accidentally done is potentially create a lifetime's worth of work out of, out of it, if I stick with it. Rob, we, thank you so much for talking with us today. We've been speaking with Rob Matthews at Artspace Liberty in the Liberty Church on York Avenue in Port Richmond, I think it is. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.